Well, good evening. I'm Anthony Luskery, and and I am Marty Wall, N6 Victor, India. Uh, my contact information is k8zt at awrl.net, and I have a website k8zt.com. And Marty's and information. I'm... I'm N6VI at SoCalRR.com, but uh, due to my prior service as uh, Vice Director for ARRL Southwestern Division, I can also be reached at N6VI at ARRL.org or N6VI at ARRL.net. They all work. And tonight's presentation has a number of links in it. And tonight's present slide presentation will actually be the presentation for the next three weeks uh, tonight and the next two weeks, I should say. Uh, you can get the whole presentation at tiny.cc slash bgvhf. Again, and for those of you who are new to uh, Rat Pack here, these slide decks all are downloadable after the uh, after the event. So uh, you don't have to take uh, notes furiously. Yes, please do not. Also, if you see this little symbol in the presentation, that means there's a link that you can click on. I'll demonstrate some of those. So what we're going to do is Marty and I are going to tag team through today, and then we're going to do two more weeks. This is the uh, schedule for tonight. When you see an A, the red A, that's my present part of the presentation, and the r blue M for Marty. We're going to cover VHF, UHF, uh, basic setup, and then we're going to focus a lot on antennas tonight. So first of all, what are the amateur radio VHF and UHF bands? Well, they are defined as three, I'm sorry, 30 to 300 megahertz is defined as VHF. That's approximately 9.9 uh, .9 to 0 0.99 meters. UHF or ultra high frequency is defined as 300 to 3000 megahertz, approximately one to one tenth of a meter in size. And here's a little pop out from uh, the infrared uh, electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, and you'll see the radio section and VHF and UHF. These are the six primary bands in the VHF UHF. There are some above this, but these are the ones we're going to be mainly focusing on. And primary, a lot of our focus is going to be on 6, 2, and 420. Uh, this is a little chart that you might have picked up at Dayton or other places. You can also get this on the ICOM website of the VHF UHF band plan. One of the problems with the band plan for VHF and UHF is it varies somewhat based on the location. So different locations uh, use parts of the band for different purposes. So it's not like the uh, band plan for HF, which is uniform across the country. But leg legally, uh, they are the same all the way across. It's just how they choose to use them. And you know, you, you, by the way, you look at these six bands, and and, you, and of course we got a lot more of them. Um, you may wonder why we have so many. Um, uh, way back in the old days, uh, the real old days of radio, uh, governments and businesses and so on really didn't have much use for anything above the broadcast band. And we had pretty much free reign on everything else. Uh, eventually, as we showed them how useful these bands could be by building things and experimenting, they said, oh, great, we'll take it back. Uh, fortunately, we were left little segments and it's not one big continuous segment. That's a good thing. They're all little pieces along the electromagnetic spectrum uh, because each one has its own characteristics, as we'll see a little later, and is best for certain jobs or certain, uh, certain uh, tasks that you're doing. And so we have a really big toolkit. Some of the bands are pretty good size. Some are fairly small. But each one has a different job it can do, different propagation, uh, different characteristics, uh, and so on. So uh, as we look at these various bands and, and then you look beyond that to the other ones, realize that uh, we've got an, an incredible array, more than probably any other um, agency or user uh, in the country or even in the world in terms of the, the spectrum pieces we have available. And one of the things about all these bands is with a technician class, or higher license, you have access to all the modes and all the operation on these bands. If you are still a novice, uh, grandfather novice, you have some uh, small power restrictions. But other than that, all these bands are available to every amateur radio operator in the United States. There is uh, some more information on band plans. There's an AWR recommended band plan. Again, as I said, when you see this font and this little link, that means you can click on it and go out and get that information. So there is information on that. There's also uh, 
different state by state guides on the repeater.wiki site you got to scroll down a little ways to get to it and once you get down you'll start seeing state by state band plans uh, for different states and the way they utilize these bands uh, I also have the Canadian band plans uh, here's an example of one of the band plans from Western Washington so <clears throat> that's what they are now what do you do with them well first of all you need some radios so there's a couple choices for VHF and UHF, we will discuss the choices a lot more next week. But just to give you a broad idea, there's really a choice of FM uh, with analog or digital, and then uh, single sideband uh, and CW uh, modes available. Uh, but there's also a handheld choice, a mobile choice, base choice. We'll talk about all these. And some of you may also have an HF radio that has VHF and UHF bands. Most of you are going to have one vhf band with your hf radio if you bought it in the last 20 years and that's going to be six meters so even if you do not have another radio besides your hf radio if it's fairly new you're going to have six meters on it so that's one of the vhf bands we'll be talking about so what can you do with these bands well most people start out by making simple fm contacts either fm simplex that's direct station to station without a repeater it's typically look at limited to short distances a couple miles at the most due to the power level, the antenna height and efficiency, especially with HT rubber ducts. So to increase that range, we use uh, repeaters. And repeaters have been around for quite a while now. It's a great way to take a weak signal radio, hit a stronger radio that's up high with a great antenna and have a line of sight area available uh, for communication. Additional features on a repeater might include linking to other repeaters via either RF or the internet, cross-band connections, etc. Now, there's also FM digital repeater contacts. These are the so-called these are the uh, digital modes such as DMR, D-Star, Fusion, etc. And we'll be talking about those on the third evening uh, that we do this. Um, there's also additional features available on these, and they typically include linking to other repeaters via the internet, calling groups, etc. Now, these digital modes are not interchangeable. So if you have a D-Star radio, a Fusion radio, a DMR radio, right out of the box, the radios themselves are not compatible with each other. Now, there's a way to do, get some of that compatibility by using hotspots, uh, which are little boxes that connect, connect through the Internet and provide connections, uh, even with an analog radio. Again, we'll be talking more about that. There's also a weak signal operation for that. Most people use not FM, but single sideband or CW. And in the last couple of years, there's been a great growth in sound card digital modes. This is not the same digital as the digital repeaters. These are digital modes that are basically use the sound card and single sideband uh, of the radio to be able to communicate. FT8 and FT4 are very popular on six meters and two meters during contest. And contesting is something we'll also discuss in one of the upcoming weeks. There is some FM activity, but most contesting takes place on single sideband CW or FT8 and FT4. So you need a radio that's capable of multi modes if you want to operate these. At your simple HF, um, sorry, your simple FM handy talkie or mobile radio cannot do these other modes. There's a wide variety of activities, and again, we'll be covering most of these in week three. We will also next week and week two talk about choosing radios. But just to give you a quick, if you just picked up a cheap handy talkie HT radio, this is what you probably would get in the box, a radio, a charger, a rubber duck antenna, and some other little accessories. So this may be what many people start out with an amateur radio. I have a whole session on uh, buying amateur radio equipment. Uh, you can go to a slide presentation. You can also go to a spreadsheet that lists various equipment for different modes and bands. And that is all available by clicking on it. We'll be talking much more about that next week. So basically, when we're setting up a radio, we're going to focus tonight just on the most simple thing with FM analog radio. And we're just going to talk about setting it up to make contact. So we're going to assume that you don't know anything at all about amateur radio and you're just getting started then you have an HT you just took it out of the box one of the most important things to do is read the manual and also there's other ways to find out about the radio um, you can go online to YouTube you can join a mailing list for the particular model you have so different radios have different ways of doing things so you might need to read the manual or at least watch a couple YouTube videos to find how to do things 
If you lost your manual, there's a number of ways to get electronic versions. Now, one of the things I just want to mention is sometimes different manufacturers use different terms for the same functions on the radio. For example, on uh, most uh, ICOM and Kenwood radios, they call it a RIT, but on Yaesu radios, they call it a clarifier. Same thing, same knob, different label. So let's first talk about FM simplex. And the main thing on FM simplex is you need to enter the frequency into the radio. But before you do that, you need to know what frequencies are used for simplex. And there'll be some variation in that uh, by area. But here's the general idea. First of all, you cannot use the bottom of the two meter band from 144 to 144.22 is reserved for CW and weak signal mode. So you should not be using your HT down there on that. You're gonna to wanna to move up and get into the FM area before you start setting up your HT. The repeaters, which we'll be talking about later, but the simplex FM frequencies, there's a couple portions here. Um, when you're doing simplex, you wanna make sure your radio doesn't have the shift turned on, either plus or minus, you want it on simplex, uh, no shift. And you should be ready to make contacts. Here's an example of the frequency distribution. It pretty much breaks down into, if you're in the east part of the country, you're gonna be in the yellow chart here. If you're in the west, except for California, you're gonna be in the purple section of the chart. And in parts of California, they even have a little different chart here um, in Southern California. There are some frequencies though, they're the same in almost every chart and they're shown here in green. So 146.40 is the same, whether you're using 15 uh, spacing or 20 spacing. And the national calling frequency of 146.520 is the same again, no matter how your local area is divvying up the channels. So you can simply tune your radio in and give a quick call on that and see if anyone's listening. If there's no other station responding, you're maybe both on the same exact frequency. And this is something you might want to try with a friend where the radios are very close to each other. So you can make sure you're on the same frequency and everything's ready to go. Uh, you want to make sure you're both on the same band. Uh, you want to make sure the other station is not using CTCSS, which we'll be talking about more in the repeater. It's also referred to as PL tone because you can actually mute the radio unless someone's getting a tone coming in. And finally, if none of this is working, there might be a problem with your radio and antenna. This is where it's great to have a, a, a mentor in your area that can help you out directly. So here's the five steps to setting up a radio for the FM repeater. The first thing you need to do is you need to find the local repeater frequency, tune the radio to that frequency, and choose the offset. And then you can test the repeater by transmitting. Make sure you ID at the, that time. And if the radio comes back to you, that's all you need. If not, you might need to see, set a CTCSS tone and try again. After everything's working, you want to plug it into memory. So let's go through those steps a little bit slower here. First step, finding a local repeater. You can use repeater books. You can use online resources. There's one online called the repeaterbook.com. Very convenient. We let you go out and check. You can search by state. Uh, you can search by different cities. So if I go to Ohio, for example, where I'm located, I can go in and start looking in Ohio. And here's the repeaters by band. Again, we're going to be interested in VHF, UHF today. I can also go by city. So I'm in the Akron area. And this will show the repeaters in my general area. I want to show you real quickly on here. There's a couple things you want to note. Uh, if we're looking at a two meter repeater, we want to look at the offset. Is it plus or minus? A standard offset on two meters is 0.06 megahertz. And most of these are that these two meter repeaters. So they're using standard offsets. But notice we have a minus here. We have a plus here. So it depends on which one you're using. The other thing you want to take a look at and see if there's a tone required. Some require one tone, some require two tones. Um, most of the repeaters I use in this area use a tone of 110.9. So most of my radios are set for that. Um, you go down to the, VH, the UHF area, you're gonna see a different split, different frequency split and some different uh, tones. So note those other repeating settings, the shift and the CT, CTSS tone. Tune the radio to the repeater's output frequency. And if someone's talking on the repeater, you should be able to hear it at that time without doing a whole lot else. Uh, choose the offset. Uh, sometimes called the split, whether it's plus or minus. If it's a standard uh, 0.6 megahertz split, that's all you need to do. You don't need to change anything. 
other than change whether you want a plus or minus. A lot of radios will select that for you automatically based on the frequency you choose, but not always. If you key the mic and ID yourself, you may or not, not get a response. The reasons for no response might be the repeater's out of your range, the repeater's no longer on the air, the guides are not always up to date to the last minute, uh, the repeater most likely needs CTCSS. What this is, is it's a tone, a uh, motor roll refers to it as private line. That's what this PL note, uh, note comes from here. It's a tone that's required, and this allows you to not uh, activate a repeater unless it's the one you want. So let's say there's two repeaters on the same frequency. They're separated by 100 miles, and you're right in the middle. You might be in range of both of those repeaters, and if you transmit, it would bring up both repeaters. So to prevent that from happening, the repeater owner sets it up with a tone required and the tone has to be given before you can access the repeater. So it requires a CTCSS tone. Um, another thing might be a problem if the split is set wrong or it's a non-standard split. And then of course, there might be something wrong with your radio. So check by making a simplex contact with a pers other person close by. The fourth step is if you need to put a CTCSS tone in, uh, you need to put that in from the chart. And there's two different types of tones. There's encode and decode. Encode is a tone that you're sending to the repeater. Decode is a tone that you're listening for on your radio. So if you set decode and the repeater is not putting out a tone, you won't ever hear anything because your radio will not open up and squelch. It'll be listening for a tone, and if there's no tone being transmitted, you won't hear it. So if you're transmitting simplex, you certainly do not want to have the tone decode on on your radio. Having the encode on is probably not going to cause a problem if you're working simplex, but you will probably need it for most repeaters. These are the standard repeater offsets, and most repeaters follow these standard offsets. So for two meters, it is standard 600 kilohertz or 0.6 megahertz. This fifth step is after you get everything working, you'll probably want to put the frequency including the repeater split and the CTCCS into the radio's memory so you don't have to program it again when you want to use that radio. And you're going to need to use the radio keypad, see the instructions for your particular radio. You can also program your radio by using not the keypad, but by programming it using software and an interface cable. And we'll be talking about that a little bit later. Uh, for more information on using repeaters, there's two good links here, one from N4UJW and another one talking about repeaters and the PL tones or CCTS. I'm now gonna take a breath and a drink and I'm gonna turn things over to Marty and he's gonna tell me when he wants me to move ahead by either telling okay, me thanks, or Anthony. Give me some, some message. All righty, very good. Um, I wanted to talk about antennas before we talk about radios because frankly, the antenna is one of the keys to the performance of your station, whether it's a handheld station or a mobile or in your, in your car, or whether it's a base station or you're up on a mountaintop portable. Um, the antenna is what uh, sends your signal to where it's gonna go and receives signals that your radio then can, can interpret. And uh, frankly, if I had a choice between uh, a great antenna system and a mediocre radio, or a mediocre antenna system and a great radio, I take the former. The antennas are the probably the one of the biggest determinants of how well you will get out, how well you will reach where you're trying to reach. Next. Um, unlike amplifiers, which work only one way, uh, a good antenna helps you both transmitting and receiving. So uh, it's the first choice in terms of improving your station. Next. Um, most uh, handhelds come with some sort of little, well, you know, you've heard it termed, termed a rubber duck. Uh, it's basically a, a helically wound compact antenna, uh, and they are all inefficient. Uh, any, any antenna that's less than full size is somewhat inefficient. And these are typically quite inefficient. They're fine for working across the fairgrounds or maybe a few miles, but you, or unless you're up on a high vantage point beyond that, they may, they may not work very well. There are a number of aftermarket antennas. Um, uh, often they'll be a little bit longer than the standard one, which usually means a little bit more efficient. There are a few such as one in the middle of this picture that you can see it's one of those telescoping jobs. As long as it's set to the right length, 
Uh, it now is, it can approximate a full length quarter wave antenna. Um, so that's one uh, option. However, there are other options in terms of putting a uh, piece of coax on there, piece of transmission line, and sending the signal up to another antenna that is mounted separately. Let's go on. Um, now you might think that, uh, you know, gee, I'm gonna have to spend more on the antenna than I spent on the radio. Well, you probably could, but you don't have to. Uh, homebrew or building your own is uh, one of the things that amateur radio operators can do. Uh, it's legal, it's encouraged, and you can build antennas that are absolutely as good as any of the commercial things, um, and uh, sometimes even better. That's a lot of the things that we see on the market today were the result of some ham uh, experimenting with some combination of antenna design software and so on. So here are some things that you can uh, you could build. Uh, you could build a ground simple ground plane vertical for two meters or 440 or whatever VHF band, probably for under five dollars. Most of that being in a connector. Uh, you could build a cubicle quad, which we'll cover a little later, for under ten dollars. Uh, Ken Britton, WA5VJB, uh, well known uh, VHF UHF enthusiast. Uh, in the uh, Central States uh, uh, VHF Society has published a number of designs for what he calls cheap Yaggies. These are used by the contesters often and they use uh, wood and wire basically. And you could build one of those for under $20 and have a good performing antenna. Uh, you've probably seen uh, J-Poles. Uh, it's, it's an N-fed design and uh, the classic J-Pole is made out of copper pipe or maybe aluminum if you can weld the thing up. Uh, but you've also seen uh, uh, the equivalent N-fed antenna, also called a J-pole, made of a twin lead. It's the, the flexible uh, two wires separated by some uh, uh, plastic, and they cut some things, and, and uh, basically you, make, you can roll it up and have it in your pocket, and then you can string it up from a tree. Uh, there are a couple of folks who build those and sell them for typically fairly cheaply, but you could make your own as well. Uh, all these antennas, especially if you're making, you know, ground planes and quads and, and the Kent Britain's Yaggies, uh, they can all handle plenty of power. You, the uh, the roll-up types, uh, roll-up J-poles generally have, are more limited in terms of the power they can handle, but all the others can handle pretty much as much power as you can give them. Next. If you want to buy, you can go commercial. You can get the mobile whips starting under $50 and uh, most of them are not much more than 100. Uh, and these typically have some sort of matching or loading at the base. And uh, uh, there are different mobile bases. Uh, the most common one these days is called NMO, November Mike Oscar for new Motorola. And uh, you'll find both magnet mounts for your car and also permanent mounts where you drill a hole in the roof, which I always recommend. It's actually a better a better installation uh, and then you can thread your antenna onto it if you need to change bands you can unthread it and put a different one on there are mobile whips that cover multiple bands so you could have a two meter 70 centimeter both on one antenna both going into the same dual band radio very convenient uh, you can get uh, uh, base station verticals starting uh, under a hundred dollars uh, you can get commercial Yaggies or beams, and again, we'll cover that a little later, uh, for directional work uh, starting uh, under $200. And I will tell you, I've seen loads and loads of good commercially made antennas that somebody's selling or they have too many or they're moving and they have to take them down. You can buy these for uh, significant discounts. Uh, some of them clean and ready to go. Some of them need to be cleaned up a little bit. But most of them, especially the, uh, the ones made of aluminum, you can, uh, you can take them apart, clean them up, uh, reconnect them and, and uh, tune them up and, and they'll work just fine. Next. Here are some examples of ground plane verticals. And you see, this is not a huge mechanical challenge. Uh, basically, your coax is coming up from the bottom and it will go into a connector that's a a standard chassis mount UHF connector, uh, the military designation is SO239. It has four mounting holes, mainly for mounting on a chassis, like the back of your radio, for example, but those mounting holes can equally be used to hold radials. 
uh, you know, every antenna basically has, you know, a, it's a dipole antenna, whether it's a vertical or a, or a, or an actual dipole. And, uh, you know, one half of the radiator is the vertical radiator. And then the other half is, is either a shield or ground plane radials or something like that. It could be an entire disc uh, just as well, or like the top of your car, for example, uh, if it's metal would make a good ground plane. And so these are different, uh, different means. Uh, the, the one on the, uh, the left is just, uh, you know, solid copper wire, like TW house wire that you strip. Uh, the one in the, uh, uh, down on the middle is uh, made of some copper tubing into which some uh, brass rod has been crimped in. And then on the one on the right is just, uh, looks like aluminum tubing that's been, uh, you put a lug on it and uh, stick the nuts on there and so on. So you see how simple it can be to create an antenna that will actually work quite decently. Next. Here's some other examples. Uh, uh, one on the right uses uh, those telescoping uh, antennas that we talked about earlier. So you could actually adjust it if you know the right lengths. You could adjust it for several different bands and uh, sit it out there. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> the center conductor of all these uh, takes a certain size. You want to make sure your wire is large, large enough to stand up on its own, but small enough to fit into the uh, the uh, wire opening of the uh, of the PL two fifty nine. Next, okay, we talked about the commercial uh, antennas. <clears throat> uh, a couple on the right are a couple of examples of uh, mobile whips. Uh, the one on uh, on the left of there is a uh, probably an NMO um, with a coil in it. That that's basically to uh, uh, provide some gain, and we'll talk about gain in a little bit. Uh, the one uh, next to it is a uh, magnet, magnetic mount. Uh, if you've got a steel roof, uh, and especially for small antennas like this, you'll be able to put, uh, put that on roof, not worry about it blowing off or coming off or even getting hit by trees if it's nice and short. On the left, you, a far left, you have a uh, base station, ground plane vertical. Uh, that looks like one by either Comet or Diamond. And uh, the radials thread in, and that's probably a dual band antenna, although they make them covering various bands. These things are fairly light, and they start typically anywhere from four or five feet, and then they'll go up to uh, 15 or 16 feet. Um, and again, we'll talk about why you might want a longer one later. Uh, these are omnidirectional. That means uh, as you're looking down upon them, they're uh, the the radiation is going out in all directions, and so is it receiving signals from all directions relatively equally. Um, all right, next. I mentioned gain a little earlier. Gain is basically a characteristic of an antenna that, that sends and receives, it concentrates the sending and receiving of signals in some direction other than omni. Omni is like uh, the little uh, grain of wheat bulb in your, in your, uh, in your flashlight that you take the cap off and it, it's like a candle, it glows everywhere. Uh, but when you do that, uh, an omnidirectional antenna uh, that's is a truly, uh, uh, a truly uh, in all directions, um, some of that signal is gonna go where you don't want it. And for example, um, if you have a signal going straight up, all right, um, and you're on VHF and UHF, on HF, you may want a signal to go up but certainly not on VHF and UHF because uh, those frequencies don't get reflected by the ionosphere. They just don't come down, they go off into space. So uh, it, it can help to concentrate the signal where you want it. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. Here's a typical, uh, couple of typical patterns. The one on the left, now this is looking uh, sideways at the antenna. In other words, uh, the sky's up, grounds down, and the antenna on the left is basically a simple quarter wave vertical. And you see that it radiates uh, pretty strongly up to around 300 and some degrees uh, from the horizon, uh, or rather uh, uh, 30, 40, 50 degrees above the horizon. And then there's a null going straight up. So that's okay, we want that. But look at the one on the right. Now this is multi-section, several sections. It's a longer antenna, it's a taller antenna. And it's squishing that pattern down even closer toward the horizon, which for most work uh, gives you more signal 
uh, toward the distant stations and less that's going up, uh, you know, 40 or 50 degrees. So, and, and by the way, these patterns are mirrored when you're looking down below them. That actually comes in handy when you're dealing with uh, uh, RF exposure calculations, which is another subject we've talked about on Rat Pack. All right, next. Next slide. If we look down at this, it would look like a donut uh, because it's omnidirectional in the horizontal plane. Okay. Uh, these are four models uh, from uh, Comet. They're GP3, 6, 9, and 12, I think. Um, uh, the one on the left is about five feet tall. Uh, that's one I've got on my house here. Um, the uh, next one is about, I think, uh, eight feet tall. And then you've got a couple more that are much taller, and you'll see a little black band. Those, those are uh, junctions where uh, the antennas are built to be shipped in a standard box, so you have some assembly then. Um, uh, I like to use the one pieces, particularly for portable, because uh, that is that uh, when you put those things together, it's a little set screw, and it's not really made to be taken apart and put back together many times. If this is going to be for a fixed location, like a house or a cabin or whatever, then fine. You can get the bigger one if you can afford it and you want that uh, that uh, long, that greater gain, assemble it once, leave it there, and you're good. Next. Now, we mentioned directionality earlier. Uh, omnidirectional antennas are looking all around the compass in all directions at the same time. But you may want a directional antenna. Uh, here in Southern California, we have some stations that are right near the coast, and putting a signal you know, putting half your power out toward the ocean really doesn't do you very much good. I mean, half your signal or more is being wasted. Uh, or if you're at a remote location, let's say uh, a, a checkpoint during a race, and you're trying to get back to the uh, net control, which is, you know, 30 or 40 miles away, uh, you want that signal to go toward the uh, desired location, but really you don't want to waste the stuff that isn't going in that location. So you can use uh, a directional antenna. Uh, in this case, we have a vertical pattern um, on the left that's looking at it sideways, where, <clears throat> uh, yeah, you've got kind of that null, and then you go to a, the horizontal pattern, uh, and now you're looking at it from the top down, and you can see that most of the signal is going off to the right there, and there's a little bit of, uh, there's some nulls off the sides, and then a much lower level of signal off the back. Uh, there's a there are various antenna parameters called you know front to back ratio, <coughs> so on uh, that will help you evaluate one antenna design versus another. But when you see a design like this, that means you can point that antenna in that direction you want and have much more of your signal going there than you would with an omnidirectional. Let's look at some of those antennas. Here's a cubical quad, so so named because it's basically a, it's a quadrangle. It's a, it's a square, and uh, commercial ones have been made with fiberglass and various other materials. This one uh, you could use bamboo. I've done that. Um, as long as it's non-conductive, uh, this is basically made with uh, PVC pipe and uh, some uh, probably some some wood, like uh, you know wood doweling. A notch to hold the wires. Um, three of those wires, uh, the one on the left and the two on the right, are parasitic elements. That is, they enhance the directionality, but you don't actually connect to them. Uh, the, they help shape the RF pattern. Uh, the second one, the one just left of the coupling, that's the driven element. The driven element is the one where the coax attaches and you actually launch the signal from it. And the, the bigger element in the back and the smaller ones in the front help steer it in that direction that you want. Uh, if you just put that driven element up by itself, you could use it and it would exhibit kind of bi-directional gain. It would, uh, in the directions that the, the, the uh, horizontal pipe is going, that's where the signal would be and it would be a bit of a null off the ends. But we want a unidirectional. We want it in one direction. Uh, you would put the parasitic elements on there. And it's all a matter of, you know, how long the elements are and their spacing. 
to determine how much gain, how much front to back and so on. But again, construction is pretty easy. Uh, you don't need a lot, you need a shop to build this. Next. Here's one of uh, Kent Britton's uh, uh, homemade antennas. This is a dual band, it's two meters and 70 centimeter. And you can see this loop uh, right here. Uh, that is basically the feed point. And he's got these designs so that you can just basically bend it, put the coax uh, on the two pieces and uh, the rest are just straight rods. And you will have a nice directional antenna. Uh, you could mount a preamp on there if you needed to. You could do various things. Uh, this is kind of similar to what is used for uh, transmitter hunting. And we'll cover transmitter hunting uh, uh, in another week session. But, uh, you know, simple portable. It's made with uh, probably one by one uh, uh, square uh, pieces of, of uh, wood, of lumber. And uh, I say this is probably, you know, 10 bucks or less of material. And you see in this case, they're using it as a handheld, but they also have a clamp on the end there. And so you could actually clamp this on a mast and uh, leave it there for portable use or for permanent use for that matter. Next. Okay, here's the link. And again, when you get the, uh, when you download the uh, uh, presentation, you will see that. And it basically has the instructions for multiple bands uh, with all the measurements you need. Yep. Yeah, most of this see is number, solid number 10 copper wire for the driven element and then aluminum rod for the other elements. And all right, now here's a commercially made four element Yagi. You can see it's a, it, it's a, a little more nicely made, um, usually uses some sort of uh, Delrin or other plastic <clears throat> uh, to insulate the elements from the boom. Usually these are all made of aluminum. You notice the driven element, the second one is a little thicker than the others. Uh, thickness of the antenna, the diameter of the, of the element uh, helps make it a little more broad banded. It covers more of the band than a thin conductor will. It's not, that's not so important on the parasitic elements, your reflector over here and your, uh, your uh, directors on the, on the right. And now this one is mounted vertically. Uh, and so this is vertical polarization. And that's generally what you're going to use for FM. We haven't talked much about polarization yet, but uh, you know, you could take this thing and turn it 90 degrees so the elements are parallel to the ground and it would be horizontally polarized. That's often used for single sideband and CW and other weak signal modes. Rovers use it and, and so on. So, well, again, we'll talk about that when we get to contesting. But for now, you want, uh, if you're going to be on FM, you're going to want vertically polarized antennas because that's what pretty much everybody else is using. And uh, if you have a metal mast, make sure that the metal mast is behind the last element, behind the reflector. Uh, because if you put a metal mast right there and you know near the near the driven element it's going to detune it uh you know the placement of these uh is important in terms of getting the directionality you want and getting the proper feed point impedance so uh you could you could if it was a long one you could mount it in the middle with a uh, a, a fiberglass or bamboo mast uh, but you wouldn't want to put a metal mast in there next okay we mentioned j poles earlier uh the most common ones were made from copper pipe uh, or uh, polyvinyl chloride with some wire inside. And then we mentioned those roll up J poles earlier. Uh, I've had mixed results with J poles. I prefer uh, either a, a good uh, ground plane vertical or a Yagi if I can. They're simple, they work. Um, and then uh, we don't want to forget uh, six meters. Um, you're, uh, you know, you could use a, a ground plane vertical, and some people do. But now you're starting to get into the area where a dipole or a Yagi may make sense. Uh, six, of course, you probably know already that uh, bandwidth, uh, um, <clears throat> the uh, wavelength and the frequency are inver inversely related. So at six meters or 50 megahertz, um, a half wave dipole is only about 10 feet long, five feet on each side of the feed point. Uh, that's pretty doable with uh, aluminum tubing, or with wire or anything, you can build those very easily. Um, you could also build a quad element. Uh, it's you know take 20 feet of wire and put it in a square and feed it on one corner. Uh, we actually had to do that for one field day. Um, we uh, the person who had the I was working the weak signal VHF station, 
And the person who was supposed to bring up the six meter beam didn't show up. So I grabbed 20 feet of hookup wire, uh, soldered it to a piece of coax, laid it around the corners of the tent and started working the Midwest from California on six meters. So uh, it, you know, again, you can, you can work these things on the fly. Uh, for six and even 10 meters, uh, which is a little longer, but it's also a band that uh, all technicians have privileges on uh, voice between uh, 28.3 and 28.5. The main thing is you've got a feed, a feed line, you know, coax typically, and then you separate the shield and the outer part. And one side uh, goes to one wire and one side goes to the other wire. And you just make sure the wires don't touch uh, between the two sides. And then you have another insulator on the end. And generally at the power levels you're gonna be using, you don't need these fancy ribbed glass insulators. Those are to keep high voltage from jumping because the, the voltage is highest at the ends of a dipole. But when you're using a 50 watt rig, that's not gonna be much of an issue. So you can use uh, PVC or uh, uh, Lexan or any number of plastics. Uh, here are a couple of different ways uh, to build these things. There's that copper J pole over on the left you see. Um, uh, the one on the pink here, pink background, is uh, a, a PVC uh, piece of PVC uh, cap with another larger PVC cap over it, or just tubing. Uh, and you, uh, what they've done here is uh, take a look. Uh, you see, a, like a little screw eye on either side of this thing, um, and then they've crimped the wire around a around a little thimble. That's to provide strain relief. So when you pull the wire, stretch it out. Um, you're not, you're not putting strain on the actual RF connection itself. Uh, the, the, uh, the crimping and so on and the, the screw eye take up the strain and then you have one loose wire that goes to the actual um, ballon or other connector that you have there. But again, you can see different ways of approaching this problem pretty easily. And of course, if you're building it, you might as well put a hook in the middle an eye hook so that you can string it up from a, a tree or a pole or anything like that. Marty, one of the things I do a lot of times on some of these dipoles, because I'm not running a lot of power, I go to the dollar store and buy a uh, cutting board, plastic cutting board, and then I use it by making a, a sort of Y shape here so I can mount the coax on it, put strain relief for the coax and provide my center insulator. Sure, that's that's good, uh, good material. It's uh, pretty durable, it's quite thick. It may be a little heavier than you want, but it may work fine. And, and, uh, and uh, you know, you, Anthony mentioned strain relief, just like we're concerned about with the, uh, with the wires in that pink one. Uh, strain relief is important. You don't want electrical connections that are getting yanked on all the time, especially if they move around in the wind, you'll work hard in those things and they'll come apart and you'll have to redo them. Yeah, in the case of- break off. Yeah, yeah, they'll, they'll break. Um, but uh, you see various means of strain relief on these pictures, and uh, that all works fine. If you're if you're putting a, if the uh, feed point is through a connector rather than just directly soldered to the wires, uh, then that connector shell threaded into the the uh, receptacle will provide some strain relief there. Um, rubber duck, uh, we said you know it's not efficient. Um, it simulates a quarter wave spike but not very well but uh you see here a something called a tiger tail if you can get a, a connection to the ground portion that is the the shell of the connector on your handheld before you screw the antenna on you can dangle a wire down there that makes the other half of that antenna rather than it being capacitively coupled through the body of the radio to your hand you can actually have a real wire radiator there it doesn't really get in the way and it can improve the quality of the, of the uh, signal considerably. And those are typically and, between 18 and 19 inches for two meters. Yeah, yeah, quarter wavelength. Um, and then finally, uh, you, want the, you want the antenna up as high as you can get it generally uh, without losing too much in the coax and you wanna get it outside the house. I know a lot of people who said, well, you know, I just put a cookie sheet on the table and I put the mag mount on there and it works. Yeah, it kind of works, but um, it's it's far from ideal. I mean, you know, houses are not made to pass RF. So uh, get it up, get it out the best you can. There are really nice chimney mounts available that don't cost very much. And that allows you to put a mounting mast on your chimney and then the antenna will go on there. You could, uh, 
uh, put a bracket on the eaves of the uh, on the siding of the house. Uh, as long as the radiating portion of the antenna, that is the part above the radials, uh, is not uh, looking into uh, metal or, or anything like that, get it out in the air, works out great. Um, you could use a ground-based tripod and a mast. If you go up too far with that mast, you might want to put some non-conductive guy lines on there, uh, you know, just a Dacron line or something like that to uh, keep it from blowing over. Uh, if you get winds like we do at my house, where they're often up at 80 miles an hour or so, you don't let anything just rest on a tripod. Next. Um, a lot of people these days have antenna restrictions because they live in, say, a homeowners association uh, a controlled uh, area or they have private deed restrictions that prevent them from putting antennas up. Unfortunately, uh, that is more and more frequent as you know, old houses go away and develop new developments come along. The builders typically put those in, those restrictions in to keep everything looking so-called nice so that when people come through the first project, first phase of the project, they see it looking nice and then they'll go buy a house in the second phase of the project. But you can put antennas up that don't really look much like antennas. Almost any wire vertical or wire dipole is almost invisible at a distance. So, you know, black wire and so on works great. Uh, this uh, thing you're showing, seeing on the right is called a Ventenna. It's made specifically for two meters and it looks like another uh, pipe vent on your house, uh, but it's actually a radiator. Uh, you can use, uh, uh, you can use uh, poles for birdhouses, uh, flag poles. Flag poles are, are often used for uh, antennas uh, and you can basically disguise them. So uh, you're not obnoxious looking and people don't think you have uh, you know, a, an antenna there, but you do. Here's an interesting one. Uh, uh, basically, it's disguised as a flower pot with, uh, with a, a little stake in it for flowers. Uh, but in fact, it can have a cable in there. You could have a coax and you could, or you could put a, you could actually put a, a vertical, um, you know, a piece of brass or copper or whatever else in there. And then you have some windings around the outside that provide the, uh, uh, keep, keeping the RF from going back down the outside of the coax. Um, and again, you can, you can make these out of PVC or any other non-conductive material. Uh, we mentioned transmission line or coax. Uh, you have to connect, if you have an outside antenna, you need to connect it to the radio. Um, all coax has lost, just like all glass, cuts down on light somewhat, okay? Well, you want as little loss as you can get without breaking the bank. Um, some coax, typically the smaller the coax, that is the smaller the diameter, the higher the loss, especially at VHF and UHF. At HF, it's a little less of an issue, but uh, we'll, let's talk about those. And what you wanna do, first, uh, get the best quality cable you can. Uh, there's a lot of junk cable out there, uh, and uh, you know, look look for the uh, the known uh, manufacturers, and uh, you know you could you can go with the uh, uh, <clears throat> you know the, the name manufacturers, and then there's some there are some uh, distributors that either make their own or sell it, uh, the Wireman, the Davis RF, and so on. Um, and then make sure you use the right connector for that cable and that you install it properly. Installing connectors could be a bit of a trick, but uh, we have actually have another uh, session that I think we've done that talked about doing that. And if you're not sure, you can get a piece of length of coax, approximately what you need with connectors already on it, and typically in 50 and 100 foot lengths and so on. But try to keep the run not much longer than you really need, because again, extra length coiled up on your desk is, under your desk is just extra loss. Next. To show you what I mean about loss at two meters, let's start with RG58, which is a pretty common, small, flexible uh, cable. It's about uh, uh, less than uh, 0.2 inches in, in uh, outside diameter, but 50 feet of that can lose almost half your signal at two meters. Um, and uh, at uh, if you start going into larger coaxes, that loss comes down. Um, LMR240 is... Uh, kind of an RG8 equivalent, but it's made of foam dielectric instead of solid. It's, it's, um, 
generally a little lower loss. It is designed for, for uh, VHF and UHF. And you can see that now you're only losing about a 30 year signal instead of half of it. Um, RG213 is the stuff you typically see uh, at, on, at HF stations. It's about four tenths of an inch, a little under half an inch in diameter. Uh, and the, uh, the LMR equivalent of that from times microwave is LMR 400. And now you see you're getting down to where you're losing uh, less than 20% of your signal. And then you get into the uh, comms, Comscope or uh, Andrew, uh, what commonly called Heliax, but it's actually just semi-rigid line. Uh, and they have uh, their low density foam and uh, the LDF 450 is a uh, little over half an inch in diameter. Uh, but now you're losing only 9% of the signal for 50 feet. So you see there's a big difference between using the skinny stuff and using the good stuff. You can tolerate some loss. I, I figure, you know, if you, if you lose 20% of your signal or less, you're probably doing fine. But it really depends on the signal margins. Uh, if, you're, if you're working a repeater that you can see outside your window, you can tolerate a lot of loss and it'll still work. But if you have to go simplex and talk to somebody when the repeater isn't available, uh, now those losses are going to come into play. So again, you don't have to go with the most expensive stuff, but uh, I have found some good surplus deals on brand new like spool ends of uh, LDF cable and LMR cable. Uh, get the proper connectors for them, put them on. Uh, there are crimp, uh, there are solder type connections, but one way or the other, put on, uh, put the thing on, and you'll find you have a really nice piece of cable for that purpose, and it didn't cost you an arm and a leg. Uh, this chart gives you, there are many of these charts out there. This one shows you losses of different kinds of cable uh, at, uh, at various frequencies. If it's in the green, your loss is less than a dB. That generally means you're losing less than 20% of your signal. Um, um, if uh, 3 dB, by the way, if you're not familiar with that, three decibels uh, represents lo losing about half the signal. Uh, 10 decibels represents losing 90% of the signal. So. Uh, you want to keep the losses low if you can. Uh, as far as the connectors, most of your radios probably have a uh, what's called a UHF connector. Uh, and uh, that's because back in the old days with the military, uh, the highest they went was low VHF and, and, uh, and they, they just called them UHF connectors. They're actually not made for UHF, but even though they kind of work. Uh, but the PL259 was the military designation. And if you're going to use those, I recommend using the uh, Amphenol 83-1 SP. That's uh, uh, silver plated, which makes the soldering a lot easier. Or you can use a specific crimp connector that's made for that kind of cable. Uh, RF Industries and several others make crimp type. Now you need the right tool for it, but it can be easier for those who don't know how to solder or don't want to solder their cable. Uh, and if you're using a foam type cable, uh, such as the LMR stuff, it's better to use a crimp connector anyway because the heat from a soldering job can start to deform the foam. That foam dielectric uh, will kind of shrivel up and start to, you know, start to uh, uh, pull away from from the uh, from the wire and so on. So better to use a crimp connector if you're using uh, any kind of foam cable. Uh, the BNC um, is basically a bayonet type small. Uh, connector. Uh, it's easy to put on and off. You don't have to sit there and thread the thing. You push, turn, and it's on. Turn, pull, and it's off. Uh, all handhelds used to use this all the time before they started running out of uh, radio real estate on the, on the radios. And now they've gone to SMA, which is basically a microwave connector. Uh, uh, but the BNCs are quite good for anything that's going to get connected and disconnected frequently. Um, I have sometimes uh, adapted some of my radios uh, that have a, a type N or a, something else in the back, I'll put a BNC on the back and then I can hook them up and unhook them very quickly. Um, the SMA, as I mentioned, is uh, basically, uh, it's used for microwave work and uh, you'll find the, the normal connections that we use have a, a male which has a pin inside the shell and then you have a, a socket uh, inside the, uh, the uh, other, the female connector. Uh, there is something called the reverse polarized SMA. That's what you'll find on a lot of data equipment, you know, routers and so on. Uh, make sure you don't mix them up. Uh, some of uh, the Chinese handhelds use the reverse polarized NMO. 
I'm sorry, SMA, because they have, uh, yeah, okay, Anthony's showing it here, because they're made in such abundance for the consumer Wi-Fi stuff that it's cheaper to use them, but uh, it's, it's not how they were intended originally. Uh, the Type N is uh, robust. It's, uh, it is good on the VHF and UHF and up into microwaves. I mean, we've used them up into the five and 10 gigahertz range and uh, uh, they can handle uh, more power. Uh, but again, the kind of radios you're using, power is not the issue. They have rubber gaskets in the back and the front and so on. So they're kind of waterproof, although I would still you know, do a good tape wrap and, and uh, otherwise waterproof the connectors um, if it's gonna be outside. Uh, but they're, they're good connectors. There's virtually low loss of constant impedance. Um, and then, of course, you have the F connector, which you have coming in for cable TV and so on, and a lot of video. Um, if you're, it, they're okay for, say, a receive-only type of antenna. Uh, I wouldn't plan on using those uh, too much on your regular equipment. Okay, so you see the various connectors here and their relative sizes. Um, the, uh, the mini UHF is similar in construction to the uh, regular UHF connector. Uh, that was just basically started by Motorola for a lot of their uh, public service radios. And sometimes if you're using a, a surplus uh, uh, public service radio and reprogramming it for, for the ham bands, you'll find that mini UHF connector on there. Um, and you can get adapters or you could just get the connectors themselves and make your own cable. All right, here's another array of these various connectors. Uh, the one on the, oh, let me go back. The one on the far right, you'll probably not run into very often. That's the 7 16 DIN. That's a relatively new connector. It wasn't really around 15, 20 years ago, but it's become the standard on uh, the towers where you have multiple, you know, up on, up on the mountaintops where you've got lots of different agencies and users with their antennas up there. They use those 7 16 DINs because it's a big conical center conductor. It can handle a lot of power. And importantly, uh, it's a solid connection that won't generate any intermod uh, as uh, a less, less robust connection might. So often the, uh, the hilltop managers will require that you use these 7 16 DINs. But that, again, unless you're running super high power on on, uh, on uh, you know, six meters or something, you won't need or use those. All the others you may run into. Uh, and uh, there are adapters, as you see here, between different, um, different genders or, and different uh, types of connector. But uh, it's generally considered not good practice to leave adapters permanently in your system. Frankly, I do it anyway. Uh, and uh, if, it, if it converts a radio to something that's more convenient for me, I do it. But make sure, again, use good ones. Uh, if, you know, the, the Radio Shack ones, if they're already left out there, and some of the ones from overseas are not very well built. I've, I've uh, put some of these on my bandsaw and cut them in half and found some horrible construction practices where the connection is made by a spring or something as opposed to uh, a, a, a threaded piece of brass going into another threaded piece of brass. All right, you've got some installation videos here that show uh, how to uh, install a, a PL259 on various kinds of connection. Uh, and uh, I've got, I, I don't remember if I've done this one for uh, Rat Pack yet, but I have a, I have a slideshow on, on doing, uh, putting a, a PL259 onto RG8 size cable. Uh, but as we mentioned earlier, if you can find a piece that already has the connectors on it and you don't really want to mess with, with uh, the crimping and soldering and getting the crimping tool or the soldering equipment, if you can get a coax that's pretty close to the length you need uh, and it's already got connectors on it, then you're good. You know, one of the other keys on that pre-made cable, a lot of times it's tested with very good equipment so you know that the, the connection is done right. Yeah, I, I happen to be able to test my own cables, but... Uh, if you're not sure, it's, it's good to maybe have somebody test it for you, or as you say, as Anthony says, if it's all, um, if it's all made commercially and tested commercially, then uh, you can pretty well be assured that as long as you 
as long as you don't abuse it, you know, you don't drag it through the dirt and soak it in water or anything else. And you, if once you've installed it, you put a little tape on it and, and weatherproof it, uh, then it'll last you a long time. That's it for mine. That's it. We're, we're down to the questions. And when you see the slideshow, you're going to see that we go into next week and the week after. So we'll be doing week two next week. Um, we'll go ahead and take questions. Again, this is the link to the slideshow. Yeah, and, and it will be on the Rat Pack Groups IO site. Yes. I have a quick question. Um, if you buy the connectors all the way, all the way at the end, then you'd have to drill a bigger hole in your house, right? So it's if, that yeah, that's a good point. You know, right if here. you're if you're passing it through a, a wall or a, something like a stud or something like that, yes, the connector is larger in diameter than the coax itself, and uh, uh, sometimes snaking the just the coax through is a little easier. Uh, and if you're going to snake the the with the with the connector on it. You probably want to cover it with a piece of plastic and tape or something just to keep dirt and junk and splinters and everything else out of it. Keep it clean while you're dragging it around under the, you know, under the eaves or through the roof or the dirt. And we'll talk a little bit uh, next week on setting up your shack and getting things into the house. That'll be one of the things we'll talk about specifically next week. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's see. Anthony, do we have our safety, uh, our safety slides on this, on this one? Oh, yes. You know what? I moved them. Let me just grab them. You know what? They're on the other slide show. You want to just cover those when we get to the we can other cover, We can cover them next week. Yeah. Uh, I moved uh, them. All, you know, I moved them when I was moving the other stuff. So okay. Yeah. Moved. Yeah. But just, uh, just a, a quick reminder when you're, when you're working with any antenna up in the air, make sure you look for any AC uh, lines, you know, wires that you don't, you don't want to run into them or have your mask fall on them or anything else. Uh, always, always, always look above to look for any uh, any wires that might be a problem, and if there we are, uh, and I'm I'm comfortable climbing. I climb towers and uh, still do it all the time. But if you're not comfortable with that, if you're not physically uh, up to it, uh, and you need to get something on your roof, look at a roofing contractor. If you want to get it in the tree, look at commercial tree services. I've hired guys to go up, you know, with the spikes up into high up into trees and hang a pulley so I can I can pull a a dipole up there into the trees. So. Uh, use the, you know, use the commercial services if you need and you're not comfortable doing that yourself. You'd rather be safe than, than uh, try something that you're, you're not set up for. And, you know, one of the things I found, one of the services I found that would do some stuff for me, um, I needed to get up to, to, to a high point. I called a company that does the uh, lights in parking lots. They had the equipment and they were also uh -huh. used to doing with electrical they weren't used to doing with antennas, but they very quickly, you know, figured that out. And it, that was a great way to find someone to do that. Oh, good idea. They use a bucket truck. Yeah. They use the bucket truck and they, you know, they went up and put a new pulley in for me on the top of my tower. And, uh, I, I was really, really not finding anyone. Then I decided who else puts things up high. And I, I found a place that did uh, parking lot lights. Great idea. The big, okay, the so big boys, when they're putting things up, use cranes. <laughs> so as you see, we haven't finished next week yet. We're, we're, it's, it's in progress, but we'll be covering the, a bunch of stuff next week. Other questions? I think we have a couple. Let me check the chat here real quick. Nothing in the chat right now, Anthony. Okay. Victor has his hand raised. Oh, someone wants a picture of the plastic cutting board antennas. If you do a quick search, you'll find a number of the uh, – just look for cutting board antenna insulator. Um, but I'll, I'll do that while you're, we have someone with a quick hand up. Yeah. Anth Victor, go ahead. Good evening. Thank you. Uh, a couple of things that maybe you're going to cover later. I'm not sure, but I thought I'd throw out tonight. You were talking about the frequencies in different areas on the BAM plans for new operators. You'll have to understand that an audio shorthand is a bit common. And I think you'll learn quickly what the reference are often. And it's not 14652 when it's clear you're discussing two meter. You'll often hear 652 or even 52. So it, it's important to listen to your radio. A lot of people 
tend to forget that. You really have to listen and, you know, follow the broader perspective of what operators are doing and how it's being handled. But again, that's all pretty, pretty simple stuff. You get used to it quickly. Yeah, and and, and there are a lot, there's a lot of terminology that uh, that we use that, uh, again, you hang around with other hams, especially the, if you're new and you get into a good club or something, that will that will provide you a lot of that feedback. Uh, there were two questions I saw flash across the, the uh, one, one comment was that when you get a commercial mag mount, typically they have more cable than you need. That is true. And uh, if you're comfortable putting on connectors, you could cut off, you know, the excess and uh, put your own connector on there. And that's a little less loss. The other question showed up as to whether you need a tuner. Generally speaking, for VHF and UHF, the antennas are resonant pretty much throughout that segment of the band. And normally you don't need a tuner. Uh, and, and frankly, building a tuner that's effective up at UHF and so on is a little tricky. So uh, the main thing is to cut, you know, cut the antenna for where you're gonna use it. Uh, two meters, usually one antenna will cover the whole band. Uh, on 70 centimeters, the FM part up 440 to 450 and the uh, weak signal part down at 432 are far enough apart that you might have some performance uh, issues. I've, I've used a single uh, vertical on 440 for both mm -hmm. FM and sideband and it works okay, but you can get, you can build a different antenna like one of those WA5 VJV cheap Yaggies they generally are made for the low part of the band for a single sideband area. And you might want to have one of those for uh, weak signal work and then a standard vertical that's cut for the higher part of the band. But generally they're pretty broad. So you wouldn't worry about tuners. Okay, there are two other questions in the chat. One is mag mount bases often have excess cable. If you don't want to cut it, does he loop it like a choke or string it out? Uh, well, Loop, looping it won't really do much because unless the loop is right at the base of the antenna and it's a, a prescribed number of turns, it uh, won't help too much. The loss is going to be there no matter how you configure it. If you can, if you can get the right connector uh, and you want to cut it shorter, they usually, and often they'll put up like 17 feet of cable or something like that. Remember, some of these are made for commercial where the radio is in the trunk, the control heads uh, up at the, at the uh, driver's position and uh, the antenna has to route all the way back to the trunk. Most of us don't do that. One other option on some mag, if it's not a sealed mag mount, you, you can disassemble it. Sometimes it's easier to change the end because it's just a pigtail on the mag end as opposed to the, the uh, connector end of the mag mount. But don't open, don't peel it apart if it's a sealed unit. Yeah. And, you know, mag mounts, mag mounts are... Uh, they're convenient, definitely. Uh, they're a little less efficient uh, because you don't really have a good connection to that roof ground plane. Um, and I would stay away from the on glass antennas that you've seen because now there's virtually no ground plane and the other half of the antenna is the coax coming back to your radio. So that's probably the worst option. Also consider antenna placement if you're gonna go in the car. We have a whole session on, uh, safe mobile operation and mobile installations. You can check the Rat Pack archives for that presentation to get some more tips on that. Yeah, and I have the link in the slideshow, so we'll see the slideshow next week. Also, some of the glass, especially on front windshields now, is not RF safe. So even if you, the antenna was efficient, you might have a problem with the particular glass because there's uh, linings or coatings on the glass. Yeah, I think they call that passivated glass or something. Uh, there was an, another question about um, crimp tools recommendation. I, I would go with one of the main, major manufacturers. DX Engineering has a set. Um, a couple of the major manufacturers pa have Paladin, Paladin. and uh, yeah. Uh, I know RF Industries down in San Diego. I get a lot of my connectors from them. They also have the tools. Uh, and most of these tools have multiple uh, slots in them for different sizes of crimp. Uh, each each connector will have a specified. They may say 0.068 for the uh, uh, for the tip and uh, 0.213 for the for the shield, for example. Uh, so make sure that whatever connector you're going to use, and and if you're only going to put on one, 
find somebody in your club who's got it and to do that. You don't need to buy the tool for one connection, but if you're going to do a bunch of them from time to time, it's worth having the tool that will do the job. And remember also when you buy crimp on connectors, you have to buy different ones for different sizes of coax. Yep. Uh, I've got the RF Industries catalog both online and physically, and they actually, they categorize, they have a, a designation like uh, uh, RG400 is, is a C1 cable, and then they give you all the connectors that fit with that particular type of cable. There are several different uh, cables that all have the same physical characteristics or very close to it, and so that same, say, a type C1 connector will go for any of those, uh, but uh, it's... You can you could probably uh, write them and get the catalog, or you could actually download it from their site, and that'll give you a good idea of the variety of connectors, uh, uh, how they fasten, what the strip dimensions are when you're going to crimp them, and so on. Other questions? Next week, uh, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about programming them, and I have some tips, and I think Anthony has some tips. I don't like I don't like to rely on computers to be able to do the programming. Yeah. And, and Tanya, we are going to be talking a little bit about getting coax lines into uh, the radio room. I've used a variety of things in my my past, and I'll talk about some of those, everything from dryer vents to uh, uh, T-tubes uh, to uh, wall mounts to bulkhead connectors. There's a, we'll be talking about a variety. Yeah, of and we'll also be talking about compliance with the National Electrical Code yes. for safety purposes. By the way, probably the, the, uh, the, my suggestion to a lot of AM starting out is that that fiberglass uh, five foot or eight foot version that Marty showed, that diameter comet, uh, for the price, you're going to get a really good performing antenna. Uh, and it's something you can put up and it'll stay up there 30 years without a problem. I've had, I've had my GP3 about that long and it's moved with me out of state and back and so on. It still works. <laughs> And they do work great for portable operations too. If you're doing a bike bicycle thing or something and you need not a specific gain in one direction, put that on the end of a, a, a push up painter's pole or something like that. And you're all set to go for uh, a great signal, much better than your handheld. Um, we will be talking about lightning arresters and grounding next week. Yep. Other questions?